So as you might know, Di and I have been called here to Coxstead in South Africa to help with the establishing of a fellowship, which is called Coxstead Family Evangelical Fellowship. And um, over the last few months, we've been going through the doctrines in our statement of faith, and that's what the series of teachings has basically been about. So the ones that I've recorded and put on YouTube, I've been recording these teachings away from the meeting, which enables us to have interaction in our meetings. It allows people to read the passages so that it's not simply a monologue. And we've also broken up into groups at times and done group work together in the meeting to get everybody really involved in searching the scripture and to um, breaking scripture down. But um, tomorrow we won't be having a, a teaching in the meeting because we've got a special baptismal service. Um, we've got, praise the Lord, we've got three people who want to um, be obedient to the Lord and be baptized. And so I thought what I might do today, seeing as I've been putting something up on YouTube every week, I thought I would do a, a devotional based on what I've been reading, what's spoken to me this week. I, I'm actually reading through Job in the Hebrew and in the English. And um, there was something that really struck me about Job 38 this week. And um, in Job, at this at this um, at this stage in the, the book, God is speaking to Job. Job has suffered incredibly. And he's he feels that God's been unjust to him. And he's wanted to call God to court, to state his case. Um, even though he knows he's not going to go that far, because how can one argue with God? Yet he's been bold enough to say that. And um, it's Elihu who basically said to Job, Job, you're speaking in the dark. Like, what do you know? And, and from that, God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. And he says to him, now gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you answer me. And God just fires all these questions about all the things that he has made to Job, which exposes Job's ignorance. And the whole idea that Job would credit un something unjust to God and almost treat God as if he's guilty. Um, God just shows Job, you speak out of darkness and you don't know what you're talking about. And at the end of this process, Job basically says, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth now and I'm going to be quiet. Because he knows that he's spoken out of ignorance. And there's something that really spoke to me in Job 38. And I'll read it in the Hebrew. And then um, I'll, I'll we'll translate a few of the verses, but it should be pretty much the same in your Bible. And it says, And so in verse 12, God is saying, have you commanded in your days the morning and ca or causing the dawn to know its place? And then verse 13 says to, to grasp, to take hold in the wings or the edges of the earth and shake the wicked from it. So what it's saying here is, it's asking Job, Job, have you ever, as long as you've existed in all of your days on this earth, have you ever said to the morning to exist, to come into existence, to, 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 to begin and cause the dawn to know its place? Have you ever done that? And the result of that light coming in would be to, to take hold of the edges of the earth and it would be to give such a shaking that um, the wicked would be removed. And it says in verse 15, 
and withheld from the wicked their light. Probably referring to the light of the morning and the dawn that have come in. So that the light that is shining is not enjoyed by the wicked because they've been removed. And it says in the high arm, have you broken? So God's asking if Job is able to bring light in that would cause the wicked to be removed so that they don't actually receive any light. What, what is very interesting in these verses is in verse 13 and verse 15, the word for wicked, resha'im, has so many letters. It's a mem, resh, um, shin, ayin, and then it's a yud, a mem, which makes it plural. But the ayin in both verses is suspended. It's elevated, it's, it's raised up. So you've got the word here, but the letter ayin has been dislocated from its place. And it really got me thinking, I did um, some reading and some people think the ayin is elevated as a respect to David. I don't know how, because Job um, is not being connected to David. Some say it's elevated and suspended so that it shows them to be rashim, which means poor. Because they, the wicked are both poor in this life and in the life to come. But I see this as a result of a shaking. That by the light coming in, there is a shaking of the earth. And the result is that the eye is dislocated. The ayin, the letter ayin, actually means I. It actually means I. In modern Hebrew, um, or even from a long time back, um, some religious Jews, they call Jesus' name Yeshu. Um, his full name is Yeshua, is, which is contracted form of Yehoshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. But the shortened contracted form is Yeshua. It's got four letters, Yud, Shin, Vav, and Ayin. Yeshua. Um, but they call him Yeshu. They remove the Ayin from the name because they make it and a kind of acrostic, which says Yisamach um, Shem Uzechoron, meaning may be blotted out his name and memory. And so they're cursing the Lord, our Messiah, by calling him Yeshu. But to call him Yeshu, they have to remove the ayin. And the ayin, the letter ayin, literally means I. So by removing the I, they don't know who Jesus is. In other words, they have been blinded. They have been blinded. They cannot see who Jesus really is. They're like Jacob, Joseph's brothers. When they met him the first time, they didn't recognize him as their brother. It was only in the second time that they met him that they saw him for who he was. And so it is with the Lord. The, the Jew of today cannot see Yeshua for who he is. Um, they call him Yeshu. But one day the eye will be put in. They will, they will once more come to gain sight and they will see who the Messiah is and they will look on him whom they've pierced and mourn over him as one mourns over God, as one mourns for an only son. So here God brings light in and in bringing light in, the earth is shaken and the eye pops out from the wicked. And this is very much in the context, because in verse 15, as we read, it says their light is withheld from the wicked. And so they are left in darkness. And this spoke to me about Jesus' return. In fact, um, we are to wait for the Messiah to come as virgins waiting in the night. And they don't know what time of the night he's coming. But he's coming in the night. And when the Lord comes, according to Malachi, if we read Malachi, it says, Malachi chapter 4. For behold, 
the day is coming, the day of the Lord, the time of Jesus' return. Burning like a furnace and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord, so that it will not leave them neither root nor branch. But as for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And the word sun there is S-U-N. It's the, 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 the sun that shines. And it says, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. In the return of the Lord, it will be like the day breaking. The sun of righteousness rises. It becomes the, to, it becomes the end of the nighttime. And it's the beginning of the glorious new day. When God brings about the light in, the eye of the wicked is removed. It's dislodged from its place because the earth is shaken and everything that those people are holding to are shaken and they're left in confusion. If you think about Jesus' return, the days of the, the future coming of the Lord are like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And in the day of Lot, we see when the two angels stayed with him and the men of the city were banging on the doors because they wanted the angels to write, to be able to write them. And um, the angels strike the men with darkness that they can't find the door. Nothing said about light there, but the idea of darkness before the exit of Lot and the righteous remnant out of the city so that the wrath of God could fall is very much a picture of the future judgment that's coming with the beginning of the what's called the parousia, the coming of the Lord, where the wrath is then poured out. And then at the end of that parousia, you have the appearance, the brightness of the appearance of the parousia of the coming of Christ and where we descend with Jesus. Different Christians have different positions on the timing of when that the beginning of that parousia begins. But um, one thing is certain that it is this coming of the Lord brings in the day of the Lord and the judgments of the day of the Lord during the time of the parousia. And so light is withheld. The light is breaking through. It's the dawn is lit up the mountains, but there's no light for the wicked. They're left in blindness. Their eye has been dislocated. It's been removed. And they are left impoverished because of it. It made me also think of what the Lord says in Matthew chapter 6. And it says this. We'll go from verse 19. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your, will your heart be also. So the Lord is calling us to be committed to eternal purposes. Not simply to look after our temporal interests. Not simply to put up a store for ourselves for the future. It's not wrong to have a retirement plan and it's not wrong to do these things. But it's wrong to be consumed with them to a point that you're not rich toward God. That you are not actually um, seeking first him, his righteousness and his kingdom. But you're seeking your own rest, your own temporal rest above everything. So you, you're very rich toward that, but you are not rich at all toward God. And in verse 22 says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. The word for clear is haplus. And it means simple. Um, it's used to speak of simplicity. When we speak about the simplicity of the faith, 
is not meaning like something that's non-academic and just really basic. It's not meaning that, it's meaning single-hearted. It means generous and it means sincere. And so when we hold into the simplicity of the faith, it means we're single-hearted about it, we're committed to it. No one's going to come with clever arguments to undermine our faith that Jesus physically rose from the dead. That's the simplicity of the faith, that I hold to something wholeheartedly. But it doesn't mean that things, certain things in Scripture are not complicated. Certain things are. Even Peter says about Paul, some things Paul writes are hard to understand, which the unstable um, twist to their own destruction. When it says your eye is simple, it's meaning your eye is generous. In the context here, we're talking about treasures, earthly treasures versus, versus heavenly treasures. And the idea is if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. That's speaking of if you are generous with the things that you have. And you, you, you share things with people, you meet pressing needs. But you don't just hoard things for yourself, but you're seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness. And you're looking to do good to um, people for a believer, first and foremost, the house of God, then spilling out into the world. Verse 23 says, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And so what the Lord is saying is, where are your interests lying? Are they in the temporal things of this life? And is that all you're looking at? Or are you also, as well as looking after your own interests, looking after the interests of others? Are you using the mammon, unrighteous mammon, to make friends for eternity? Are you concerned about people's salvation? Are you just concerned about your own retirement plan? So you can go off somewhere and live, um, enjoy the last few years of your life. It's not wrong. But it's wrong to be obsessed with it to a point that you're not rich toward God. And so what is left when you're so focused on the things that are temporal is that when the light comes in one day, when our Lord comes back and we're seeing signs of it, one of the signs of the Lord's return, the Lord is very clear that before he returns, there is a man of lawlessness who will sit himself in the temple of God and display himself as being God. And that is fulfillment of Daniel 9, which speaks of the abomination of desolation being a stopping of the sacrifice and the grain offering. And the Lord says, when you see the abomination of desolation, let those who in Judea flee. You're talking about a Jewish temple in Jerusalem here. And so there cannot be a Jewish temple in Jerusalem without a Jewish state. But 1948, there was one. So it was a major sign preceding the Lord's return. Another thing will be a temple. There has to be a temple in Jerusalem. But the scripture gives us other signs. It speaks of pestilence. And pestilence that will take out a fourth quarter of the earth. Well, I don't think COVID-19 has fitted that bill. And no matter how pervasive and how much, how much of a pandemic we can argue, but regardless of how much a pandemic it has been, it will not equal what is coming. It is just a taste of that which is to come. We talk about climate change. We talk about how um, there are big changes in the climate, uh, which has affected the earth. And we can debate whether humans are causing it or not, but there is a lot of agreement that whether humans cause it or not, there is climate change. But it's not even what anything near at the moment what it will be. You're talking about a quarter of the earth the, the, the oceans, a third of the oceans turning to blood. You're going to have hailstones falling down that are huge, we mix with fire. You're going to talk about volcanic, huge volcanic eruption 
and the, the movement of tectonic plates to such an extent that islands are moved out of their place. You're going to talk about a dimming of the light of the sun and of the th a third of the stars losing their light. The, we, we, we're heading for major climate, climate disaster. And it is because of human sin, but not in the way that the climate change advocates are arguing. I would say get rid of all the human carbon and try your best, but it's still going to heat up. We're heading for huge turmoil. We're heading for major wars. Scripture is very clear that we'll hear of wars and rumors of wars where brother turns against brother. Where, in the, in the words of um, Isaiah chapter 19, Egypt turns against Egypt. It's, um, it's nation against itself. A nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, civil disturbance. The same nation turning against itself, brother against brother. We're going to head for the major unification of, of, of people under a one world ruler called Antichrist. We're heading for many things. And this is all part of the darkness getting so dark that there becomes that glimmer of the light with the return of the Lord. And when that happens, and there's a shaking of everything that's been created on this earth, everything of the earth seeming like it's pulling away at the seams, then the eye of the wicked will be removed. They'll be left in darkness, in confusion, and they will curse God. They will look at when they tormented by pain, severe pain. They curse God. They have no light. But we who are invested in eternity, we who trust the Lord, will be vindicated. And it really comes down to trust. Do I trust myself or do I trust the Lord? Do I trust his word? Or do I trust in my own devices? Isaiah 50 says this. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant? His servant is the Lord Jesus. And the one who, like Isaiah here, was obedient and persecuted for it. If you go to verse 5 and 6, it says, The Lord has opened my ear. That's what you, a slave, would happen to a slave when he committed himself to the master. He would actually have his knee. When we're talking Jewish slave here, he served his master for six years, but he wants to serve him for the rest of his life. And so he, his ear is taken to a door and an awl is, is, is hammered through it and it pierces the ear. And the ear speaks of obedience. So when a... A slave has his ear pierced. It's a sign of his submission and obedience to his master. If the word for hear in, he, in Hebrew is to hear is lishmoa. And if you tell someone to, to listen up, you'd say shema. And shema is the first word of the, the great shema. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. But that shema does not simply mean hear something, hear sounds. It means to actually listen and to do what God wants you to do. That is the nature of a true servant of God. He hears what his master says and he does it. And look what it says in verse 5. I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. So Isaiah, prefiguring Messiah, the Lord Jesus, he experienced hostility because of his obedience to God. But God vindicates his servants. In verse 7, he actually says, For the Lord God helps me, Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. The Lord 
helps me. The word there for help is la azor, which az, azor would mean to help. We have the word ezel, which means a helper. But if you look at that, it's made of three letters in Hebrew. Ayin, which we said means I. Resh, or Zion, and Resh. But the first two letters, the Ayin and Zion, make the word Az, or Oz, which means strength. And so God helps him, and he's a real help to him, because he is the strength that Isaiah needs to endure the hostility and the humiliation. To have someone spit on you is a great humiliation. And that's what the Lord experienced on the cross. And so he will be vindicated. And verse 10 says, Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? So here's the thing. We, in this time, end up walking in periods of life in darkness with no light. It's darkness because we can't see what's happening. There's a lot of confusion. That you can't see what's going to happen five steps ahead. That's the situation. And there are many believers going through that today. Not just in places where believers are persecuted. But even in the West. As we see great uncertainty on the horizon. And governments seeming to go overboard with mandates. We, we have a lot of disturbance and it can make believers feel unsettled. We walk in darkness. There doesn't seem to be a light at the end of the tunnel for some people. But look what it says. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. That we seek the Lord in every situation. In the good times. And in the bad times, just like your marriage vow, you promised, I will love you for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. That the Lord is not a God that we just turn to in the good time and the bad times, but he's a God that we serve at all times. Even at times where there is darkness and we can't see five steps ahead of us. When we're overwhelmed by disaster, we're overwhelmed by things that are occurring where our jobs may be on the line, where we don't even know if we can even go back to the country that we reside in. That because we, 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 the borders are closed to certain people. Like if you don't have, uh, not vaccinated and you are wanting to go back to a country that requires you to be vaccinated, what do you do? There is a lot of uncertainty that some people are facing. Some believers in other countries don't even know if they will live to see another week because the persecution is against them and there are people watching and at the right time or the wrong time, they might strike and try to kill such people. We've had ISIS break in a number of years ago into the Middle East, into the Levant, Taking people, not even, even if they weren't true born again believers, just because they claimed the name Christian, they were beheaded. Walking in darkness with no light says, let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Verse 11, behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands, Walk in the light of your fire, and among the brands you have set ablaze, this you will have from my hand, you will lie down in torment. And so they make their own light. In the West, especially in the West, Western society has made its own light. It said no to the light of God, and it said no, we'll, we'll make our own way, thank you very much. This is what God says to the Western world. You will lie down in torment. This is not some threat of human terrorists that the, the world would want to brand this as. This is almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, who will step in with the breaking of his dawn 
and he'll take out hold of the ends of the earth and he will give it a very, very great shaking. And it's those who trust in the Lord that put the Lord first in their lives, that love the Lord above their own lives, that will be sustained. But those who are wicked, who are making their own way and their only, their only thought is about their temporal success or their temporal, the temporal enjoyment for humanity. They have their own light, but they will lie down in torment. Their eye will be removed by the shaking. They will be left impoverished and they will lie down in torment. That's what scripture says. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. That um, if you hear his voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking, and you read his word, read the book of Revelation, know the things that are coming upon the earth, and what we're seeing in the earth today is just a taste of what is to come. And the good news is that those who know God through the finished work of Jesus Christ and accept that salvation given as a free gift will be kept and sustained by him. That even if they lose their lives, they gain it for eternity. That is the hope of the gospel, that we have a hope that goes beyond the circumstances of this life, that we have a peace that can even cause us to be at peace in the midst of a storm. That is the God that we serve. When the shaking happens, we don't lose our eyes and we are not left impoverished, but we gain riches for eternity, for we have built up a treasure in heaven. <music>